All right, Alexander, let's talk about Justin Trudeau and his shocking, shocking uh, statement to the parliament in Canada, where Justin Trudeau claimed that, according to his uh, intel agencies and the reports he's been given, that India uh, assassinated a Canadian citizen in British uh, Columbia, who I have found out, by the way, is actually, many people emailed me and they told me that this person is not a Canadian citizen. He was, he was trying to become a Canadian citizen. He was working towards becoming a Canadian citizen, but he didn't quite get there. I don't know. This is what various people told me. Either way, Trudeau came out with this, uh, with this allegation towards India, and uh, here we are. We have something big brewing. What, uh, what's going on here? Well, I mean, it's a, it's a very, very interesting story. And I have to say, one of the most interesting things for me, uh, this is, you know, from my own particular perch in London, is to see how the British media is covering this story. Because, of course, the British have been making a big effort over the last few weeks and months to try to improve relations with India. Sunak, who is, of course, of Indian origin, who's our Prime Minister, has been trying to become friends with Modi. Modi doesn't seem terribly interested, by the way, but anyway, he has been. And it's, it's, it, it, it's a striking contrast because, of course, the in, what Trudeau is basically accusing the Indian government of having done in Canada is exactly what the British accused the Russians of doing with the Litvinenko and Skripal affairs. But the British media has been very, very careful not to cover this story about Canada and India with anything like the same kind of feverish indignation and outrage and anger that they showed in connection with the Litvinenko and Skripal affairs. So, you know, I, I just wanted to point to that contrast. By the way, we have an inquest underway in Britain over the Skripal affair. It's very interesting. It's already clear that there are problems with the story and that the British government is trying to pass, uh, you know, prevent information coming, being disclosed in the inquest. All of that, a discussion for another day. But anyway, I just wanted to make that, that observation. So, first thing to say is, I don't know whether the Indian government was involved in the assassination of this individual. I, I don't know. The Indian government has categorically denied it. The Congress party, which is the main opposition party in India, is supporting the Indian government fully on this issue. Um, I don't know anything about the background of this person. I'd be given all kinds of information from all kinds of people which suggest that he might have been involved in some rather alarming and concerning things. But again, I'm not going to judge this. What I find most interesting is that this story has come out now. The first thing I want to say is, let's be frank and clear, extrajudicial killings by governments happen. The British government does them. It did them in Northern Ireland. It goes after people who are jihadi fighters in all sorts of places. The United States does them on a much bigger scale, of course. If India did do this thing, it would not be the first time a thing like this has happened. If Israel, of course, does this on a very, very much bigger scale. The United States has been trying recently to develop good and friendly and close relations with India. It sees India as an important counterbalance to China. So... Why, given that this sort of thing does go on, has it suddenly been spoke, promoted in this fashion? Because, to be very clear, I don't think Justin Trudeau says these things on his own initiative. He's been told to say it by his intelligence service, and his intelligence services are connected with the intelligence services of the United States. They're all part of the Five Eyes. Why has it come out? Well, I'm going to suggest it is because the Western governments, especially the government of the United States, 
is deeply angry with Modi at this particular point of time. And what is it that has made them so angry? It was what happened at the G20 summit. The fact that the G20 summit statement included a paragraph about Ukraine, which many people around the world see as leaning towards the Russians, didn't contain any of the criticism of Russia that the um, US and the G7 states, the Western states, wanted. The, the G20 statement overall, as the Financial Times rather angrily said, contained Chinese talking points. This uh, attempt to pull India away from the BRICS has been a spectacular failure. The BRICS summit meeting happened in Johannesburg. India was fully engaged with it. It supported the expansion of the BRICS. It ex supported the BRICS agenda to build up this financial architecture. So some people in Washington are very, very angry. And they seized on this particular issue of this particular individual in order to circulate this embarrassing story about Modi, about India, which is intended to embarrass the Modi government and is also shot across the uh, sails of the Modi government. That is telling them, look, um, we've been your friend up to this point, but if you continue along this path that you are taking of working with the Chinese, working with the Russians, working with the BRICS, making the BRICS the centerpiece of your foreign policy, despite this meeting we had with you a few months ago when you came to Washington. If you continue along this path, then be aware we will come after you in a big way. So I think this is what this story is about. I say that because, to be frank, I don't think that the Western powers are really as angry and as outraged about this affair as they pretend to be. Yeah, I agree with you. I think this is a, a threat, a warning to, to India. No, no doubt about it. That G20 meeting between Modi and Trudeau did not end well. I mean, the readout from India after, after that meeting that they had was, was pretty brutal towards, yes. uh, towards Trudeau and, and Canada. Uh, just to add some context to, to this, uh, to this video, the individual is uh, Hardeep uh, Singh Nijar, who was uh, killed in Vancouver, in a suburb of Vancouver, in British Columbia, Surrey, and he was killed on June 18th at a Sikh temple. He's been accused by the government in India of being a Khalistani terrorist and um, part of of a separatist movement, which which goes decades uh, back, by the way, and and to be fair to um, India, they've they voiced their their uh, grievance with Canada that you know Canada has been harboring these these separatist uh, these individuals and the separatist movements for many many years, and and India is not happy with with uh, the fact that Canada has been providing um, a safe a safe haven for these guys, so. That's that's just the backstory as to as to what happened. So this happened a couple of months ago, and, and here we are with with Trudeau sending out this this warning shot to to India and, and a warning shot to BRICS actually, I yes. mean, because trying to uh, telling India telling India stop with with BRICS is is the ultimate way to to break BRICS to break BRICS apart. Yes, <laughs> yes. Say that fast three times. Yes, <laughs> yeah. Well, that, that was the idea. I mean, I mean, first of we had a lot of pressure in South Africa with the ICC warrant against Putin. <laughs> and uh, there were lots of attempts to um, undermine, the, you know, the South African uh, management of the BRICS summit. Then there was an attempt to get Modi to stay away from the BRICS summit. You remember there were rumours that he wasn't coming after all. And, of course, he did come. And he had a meeting with Xi Jinping, which went very well. And, of course, these big decisions were made at the BRICS summit. And then, of course, we had the follow-up summit, which is the one that happened at the G20, when, again, it was the Indians and the Chinese working together um, as leading members of the BRICS who basically gained control of the agenda. And I think, you know, this has been 
a very alarming and disappointing development for the US. I think they hoped after Modi's visit to Washington a couple of months ago that they'd won him over. We said on our program, we said in the Duran that this was a misunderstanding, that Modi had made no such commitments. India does want good relations with the United States. Why would it not? But it is not going to compromise on its position with the BRICS, and it is not going to compromise in its relations with Russia. But with the neocons, who are in the ascendant in Washington, whatever stripe of neocon they are, you're either with them or against them. It looks as if, as far as they're concerned, India is not, and Modi uh, is not fully with them. So they've raked up this business over this particular individual who was killed in Vancouver. So, uh, you know, I, 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 you know that, that's how it looks to me. And, you know, I was reading um, today, there's an editorial in the Daily Telegraph. So, you know, uh, um, you know, it's, you know, that um, killing people on foreign territory is going too far. You don't, you must never do this sort of thing. You're telling me? <laughs> How often has the United States done this? How often has Britain done this? How often does uh, Israel do these things? How often does France do them? Everybody does them. And the way to handle a story like this, if you get information that something like this has actually happened and you don't like it, if a Canadian government found out that the Indian Secret Service was really involved in killing this person and that they didn't, the, the Canadians were very unhappy about it. What you do is you contact the Indians through diplomatic channels. They tell them, look, we know you did this. We don't like the fact that this happened. Don't do this again. If you continue doing this thing, it will cause major problems in our relations. That's the way it's done. You don't go and go to your parliament and issue public speeches and say, well, we have, you know, it's very likely, it's highly likely, remember Theresa May saying that over the script holes, uh, it's highly likely that it was India and pointing fingers in this kind of way. This isn't the way it's done. Clearly, a message was being sent. So is the strategy now... Um for, in order to break uh, to break BRICS, is it now to go after India as a member of BRICS and then to go after uh, the United Arab Emirates as a member to be of BRICS? Because we talked about how um, how the United States and the EU they were making trips to to the UAE to to get them to to move away from from their aspiring memberships into into BRICS, and now we have this warning to India. Is that are these the two countries that that they're choosing? Because, you know, Lavrov met with with uh, with um, um, Wang Wang Yi the other day. Um, Putin is going to to China, I believe, in a month. Yeah. Obviously, the 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 the, the strength of of BRICS right now is is this this unbreakable bond between China and and Russia. Is the U.S. now saying, "Okay, we're not going to break Russia, China apart. We're going we're to be going after these two countries, but let's work on India as a current member, and let's work on uh, the UAE as an aspiring member, and see what we can we can do there." Absolutely, that's exactly what they want to do. I mean, they want to go after the weakest, what they think are the weakest countries, not weakest economically, because India and the UAE are strong economically, but they're weak in the sense that they, Americans believe and hope that they still have many friends there. Now, they do. They do have friends, certainly in India, and most probably also in U the UAE. But what they don't understand... And where I think they're miscalculated, they miscalculated, for example, over the Congress Party in India. Uh, these people who are their friends in these countries, nonetheless, are patriotic and loyal and wish to follow the best interests of their countries. And what we see with this business, with this um, Khalistani activist, as that's what the Indians say he is, is that instead of creating divisions with this, within India, this coming after India in this way has caused the Indians to close ranks. 
And that's, I predict, what's going to happen in the UAE. And, of course, it previously happened in South Africa as well. In India, in the case of India, it is particularly crass, by the way, because the Congress party, the main opposition party, is, of course, structured very much around the Nehru Gandhi family, which, of course, has dominated Indian politics for much of the period since India gained independence. And, of course, one of the prime ministers, the fact the most famous prime minister that the, Gandhi, the Nehru Gandhi family produced, apart from Nehru himself, who was Indira Gandhi, was in fact mass- assassinated by two Sikh bodyguards who were influenced by the Khalistan movement. So it's, you know, you're not going to win over friends in, amongst the Congress party by appearing to support Khalistani activists in Canada and complaining about them. But of course, you know, people don't understand that. Maybe in Washington, maybe don't understand that in Ottawa either. They never really get much feel for the politics of these countries. And you can already see that BRICS solidarity is not only tightening, but it is becoming more uh, more effective. Now, we have at the moment a meeting of the General Assembly in the United Nations, you know, the big world body. And it's clear now that the BRICS countries are coordinating and working together with each other. And whilst Lavrov, Lavrov is at the UN because he's representing Russia at the UN. And there was a meeting of the representatives of the BRICS states and Lavrov chaired it. (laughs) And they were coordinating their moves in the General Assembly on the various committees and the General Assembly and the various discussions, they're all making sure that each knows exactly what the other is going to say, what they're hammering out their positions. So you can see that even if this isn't yet a block, it's starting increasingly to look like a team. Now, we have had a series of very important and consequential meetings between the Chinese and the Russians. But notice that these have happened directly after Wang Yi, who was travelling to Europe, met with Jake Sullivan in Malta. Mysterious meeting, unannounced beforehand, not clear what Sullivan was trying to achieve there, but the sense that I get is that he was trying to string the Chinese along, get them to agree to a summit meeting with Biden. The Chinese don't seem to have been very interested in that. So anyway, there's a meeting in Malta, The Chinese have not published a readout of that meeting. So they weren't happy with what happened in Malta. But then Wang Yi gets on a plane, he flies to Moscow. This is a long-standing meeting. And he has three days of meetings in Moscow. Firstly, he meets Lavrov. And the Russian readout says quite clearly that Wang Yi briefed Lavrov about the meeting Wang Yi had with Sullivan in Malta. So Lavrov now has a full briefing from the Chinese about what happened in Malta between Wang Yi and Sullivan. And then, of course, Wang Yi has another meeting with Putin's national security advisor, who is Nikolai Petrushev. This is a huge meeting, apparently. There's not been much of a readout about that, but apparently, again, they're coordinating policy. And then afterwards, Wang Yi has a very friendly meeting with Putin himself. I doubt that this was you know, a very detailed or substantive meeting, but it was basically Putin again going out of his way to say, you know, you're great friends, we're very good relations. Wang Yi reciprocates and the ground is now being prepared for this very important meeting that Putin is going to have with Xi Jinping in Beijing. So Xi Jinping went to Moscow in March. Putin is going to Beijing in October. Two big meetings between these two leaders. As you correctly say, they, to some extent, form the core of the BRICS. India, though, is becoming increasingly central. They're all working together as a team. They're working in the General Assembly. And all this pressure that's being exerted on them by the West is pushing them even closer together. I think that 
The West needs to re-examine its strategy. It needs to think very carefully about what it's doing. It's putting pressure on all of these countries. Instead of working to drive them apart, is pulling them even closer together. Yeah. Unfortunately, they're not going to reassess no. their strategy. No, of course not. <laughs> All right, we'll leave it there. TheDurad.Locals.com. We are on Rumble, Odyssey, BitChute, Telegram, Rockfin, and Twitter. X. X. And go to the Durad shop. Use the code GOODDAY. Get 10% off all merchandise. Take care.